Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.G. Chichester, superhero movie brackets in our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capes and lunatics. Hope to see you there. world of capes and lunatics, gods and monsters, there are those who walk another path, those who walk through the desert, who walk across worlds. There is one, a Jedi named Obi-Wan, mm-hmm. and this is his story. Avast me hearties and welcome once again to For the Stream Ahead. I be your Captain Charlie, the Professor Esther, and with me as always is me skinny rich friend. Hey, it's Maz. Hey, Maz. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the penultimate episode, take a drink, hmm. of Obi-Wan Kenobi, part five. Obi-Wan plans his next move as the Empire, closing in, tries to draw him out. Our director this week, of course, is Deborah Chow. Our writers are, as always, Joby Harold, Andrew Stanton, and of course, it's all based on that work of that young, crazy up and coming kid, George Lucas. Both Joby and Andrew get the written by credit for this. All right, Maz. This <laughs> episode. Man, oh man, they really uh, kicked it into another gear this episode. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and this was because I saw I, you know, at first I was like, why are they always running? And but they actually mentioned that they were actually in the process of evacuating everyone from this base because mm. I thought, wow, man, that's like another base that they just have to evacuate. But they were like, no, no, we were already going to evacuate this base. We're already in right. The These are process. all like waypoints. Got a ship ready. They're just going from point yeah, to point. To yeah. point. Um. You know, we get to, um, I probably shouldn't have closed that because I can't see. Uh, we, we got, we got to see the, uh, fake Jedi again. So that was good. Aja. Uh, Aja. Yes. Aja is back. Um, and you know, it, I, I like his character. I, I would, I hope we get to see more of him. You know, um, I really felt he brought a lot to the show. Um, because, you know, I, I do think that this kind of a character, this, this person who is the, the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the everyman, the, the one of us. Yeah, the everyman and swimming the Connors, with like you know, the, heroes the person, and monsters, you know? Exactly, you know? And it makes sense when you think about it that, you know, obviously there's going to be Charlatan Jedi out there. There's going to be, you know, it's the same way you got televangelists, same way you got all kinds of preachers out there, all of all, of all faiths that are, right. you know, out there, even if they do good. And God bless them. Some of them really believe they're doing good, but you know, they always take their, their, their bit off the top. And I like seeing him here and I like seeing him kind of forced into an interesting spot because he's like, you know, I, I kind of, don't have any place to go because that that inquisitor lady attacked me um, <laughs> and now i'm wanted so i guess I've, i'm just like a jedi now you know? it's it's also a bit Which of like a, me it's also a bit of like if a wrestling fan ever got invited into the ring you know what what could be cooler than that you know he's been walking around pretending to be a jedi now he meets a real one not only a real one he meets obi-wan and he's like everybody's heard of obi-wan like, this is a dream come true. Like, this is everything he pretended to be. Now he gets to maybe find a measure uh, uh, of actually being that. I mean, 
on some level, yes, but also on some level, you know, it's great to be a uh, wrestler until you hit the turnbuckle. You sure. know, <laughs> sure. You know, and that's sort of like, oh yeah, man, I get to, I no. get to be a Jedi. Oh, now I'm hunted by the Empire. Right. No, Wait. but but he 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 uh, had an altercation with Riva, and and look at it, he's he's back. He's like, let's go, man. I'm here. What are we doing? You know, What's the plan? Whatever we get next. You know, if everyone makes it out of all of this alive, because you don't know yet, um, I would love to see if Eva makes it out. Because we, we get revelations about Reva in this episode. Mm. I would love to see them in kind of a buddy a, a buddy series, just Reva, Reva and the fake Jedi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Reva sure. and ha- Haji Et- Estri, I believe his name is. <laughs> Yes, um, Haja Estri. Yes, that right. that would be just awesome. Him and Riva, and just you know, her, her not taking his BS. Him just being a lovable lug. Uh, it could be interesting. It could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, but I, I say you put Haja with anybody. Put Haja with Leia. That's a show I'd watch. Mm. Oh, that'd be neat to see. I was actually waiting. Well, okay. Well, we we won't get into that because that gets into the next episode. But oh, um, okay. Yeah, I don't want to get into the next episode because, but spoilers, kids, Leah does survive. Okay. Oh, you so, don't say. <laughs> yeah, so I know that's a big spoiler for this. I think, I think we can say that yes, Leah makes it to the end and will, you know, uh, in about 10 years turn into, uh, turn into, um, Carrie Fisher. So that's perfect. Mm. Yes. Um, I was going to say she's going to turn into a brother kisser, but you know. Well, too. I wasn't going to. You know, <laughs> look. <laughs> you never kissed your sister, no. Uh, Maz. No. You never <laughs> kissed your sister? <laughs> no. Mean, you know, not like, not like passionately, but you know, you, you share a no. peck with your sister. It's, you know, it's your no. sister. You, yeah, I guess. You have, no, okay. I don't. You know, we hugged. Yeah, maybe not on the lips, but you know. <laughs> Look, and it, it, it's a thing. It's a thing. Okay, it, it fair happens. enough. Right. I'm, sure, I'm sure she felt as bad about it as everyone else when she realized, like, oh, right? Of course, I'm just, you know, that's that was not what I what I wanted. And no, I to be <laughs> fair, to be fair, she was never into Luke. That hmm. was all. Like, first off, Luke's the one who's like, "Hey, can, can you give me a kiss for luck?" Because yeah. Luke that's is, true. Is, Kind of creepy, quite frankly, but you know, and it's you know, uh, well, because you know, he's been living on the desert for like years, and it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like you're 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 a female, and although I know females, there's only so many females on Tatooine, and Diggs is dating like three of them, so you know, (laughs) I got the feeling Diggs was kind of the Fonzie of Tatooine. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, uh, where was it? By the way, getting back to this story, um, so they're in the in the place, they're planning their their evacuation when all of a sudden, uh, everything the the doors lock shut. They can't the 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 bay door is locked shut, and they don't know what the problem is. They have to figure it out. But in the meantime, they realize they need to lock everything else down because they know the Empire is after them. And it's just a little too convenient that all of a sudden the bay doors have shut down on them. Mm. Uh, and they start preparing for everything. Meanwhile, Riva is meeting with Darth Vader, where she effectively says, you know, we know where he is. We just got to go and get him. And he sends Riva in to get him. And, uh. Well, he's there with her too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, well, at the start of it, he's staying up in the, in the Star Destroyer. But oh, yeah, well, when the whole right, Star Destroyer enough, yeah. goes. Yeah, I, I thought he was the one that was responsible for just like force closing, uh, the gates. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, it's revealed later, but no, that's Lola. Oh. Remember the, the little, the, cause her eye turned red. Oh, that's right. The, the robot. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. They right, put a right, little right. tiny, tiny restraining bolt on her. Mm. Although what I find fascinating is just how obvious restraining bolts are and how easy they are to take off. 
And the fact that it wasn't you know, noticed guess- before is, I mean, it's just one of those things. That's one of those things. The episode was so good. I'm willing to overlook little subtle, you know, yeah, yeah. things like well, that. Well, you know, yeah. And I guess the restraining bolt, it was, it was relatively small. It was obviously one made for a smaller droid. So, you know, yeah. a smaller droid needs a smaller retru- restraining It almost bolt. felt like you were watching like an episode of Dora. Where's the inhibitor chip, Dora? And then an arrow comes yeah. out of the screen pointing to it. Where's the inhibitor? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say you're wrong. But, uh, <laughs> I didn't mind it too bad, though. Yes, but it is kind of cool, and it is. It's also neat the idea that oh, although again, why are the Jeffries tubes so small? Someone put everything in there, you know, <laughs> and they're like, I'm not exactly built for going into into the tubes. It's like. Well, maybe you, maybe you shouldn't have put the tubes, like, built it in such a small space. Although, you know? I'm sure whoever was contracted to build that made it so that only they could fix it, so they would have a lifetime customer. Had to be the Jawas. I can see that. Jawa, it's like, Jawa, yep. yeah, they just go in there, they fix it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> what, are you going to go fix it? I, I could do it exactly. for a price. Maybe That's you could stretch her arm really, really far. I don't know. Yeah, but you know that that makes for a very interesting idea that you know there are just sp- tiny species that just you know that's their whole business. They go into small spaces, they fix stuff, and you got to use them because they yeah. built it and they built it so they could get it. And no one, no one is thinking when they're building it. Oh, right. What if it breaks down? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they only find and that out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> once and the price pro- goes up, it's like, oh, that was yeah. the introductory price. Yeah, you know, well, uh, you know, I'm sure it's reasonable. Not everyone's uh, looking to go. It's just, you know, you need them because you can't do it yourself. It's like Apple. Yeah. If you can't fix it yourself, you're just going to have to buy a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, right, right. yeah. But I found it very interesting when Reva does get down to the surface because it does, it does give us our big reveal in this. Um, uh, now, I'm trying to think, did Reva and Obi-Wan meet before this, where she told him who she was, or she didn't, or is this when he's first, le- I think this is when he's first No, they, they sort of almost came to face, face to face, they fought a little bit, uh, or she was chasing him when she escaped, when yeah. she fought Haja instead, so. Yeah, but like, she hasn't, um told him that he, she was a young lady. No, no, no. He figures this it out. This is when he out. finds this yeah. out. Yeah. 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 And, and and good for him that he's like really, he's really, he's really good at figuring these things out. Because yeah. that, of course, that is what is important is that, that understanding humanity, that's what makes you a Jedi Master. You know, which of course Vader is not. Although Vader, he tries. He's trying in this one. Um, Again, he's too clouded. You no, know, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's he's good at what he's good at, and it, you know, it's kind of strikes me. This Vader reminds me a lot of Doctor Doom, where in certain situations he just seems all powerful, hmm. but the minute someone has an edge on him, he just crumbles. Hmm. Because I do think that is a lot of what Vader is: is that he is because he is predictable because. And that's and that's the other thing that we get throughout this is we get this flashback scene, which is a really good flashback scene. Um, if you can, you know, I know that there's there's talk about oh they de euthanized them, you know, I don't know about that, but you know you, you let it go, and they are in this fight. Uh, well, it's and it's actually a sparring match, and we can get from this that Anakin has has sparred with Obi Wan a lot, but the whole point of this is teach Anakin not to give in to his anger and his frustration and his need ambition. to win. Uh, that's not what the Jedi did. Ambition. Yes. And it's like, and it is just this idea. And this, I guess, is where you come to that idea about what the Jedi at their best should be and about the idea of the balance of the Force. That it's not about pushing. It's about letting the force flow through you and just being a good steward of the force, you know? And, you know, and to that extent, that is where they went wrong, becoming generals and knights and 
you know, fighting because that is what pushes the force out of balance. To that, that leads to the creation of the Sith in the sense that the only way that you can have balance when one group is pushing on one end is to have someone else push on the other. And what you need is you need to have the balance of the force being allowed to flow. And this is what I think Obi-Wan is trying to let him understand, that this pushing isn't going to get him where he wants to be. And there's even a great line in this when Obi-Wan is talking with them, when they when he realizes what they have to do. Um, you know, he does leave his lightsaber and they say, how are you going to fight him without a weapon? And they say, there's other ways to fight people than with a weapon. And then you actually get to that fight between them in the flashback where, yes, Obi-Wan is disarmed and Anakin's like, you know, you're, you know, sort of like, I have the high ground. There's no chance, you know, but exactly then Obi-Wan fights on and then just forces Vader's lightsaber out of his hand, you know, because, you know, that's the point is that because Vader allows himself to be clouded because Vader allows himself to only be focusing on what is in front of him and what his goal is. He lets himself get pulled away. He lets himself get pulled in the wrong direction. And because of that, he's, he is easily tricked. He is easily manipulated, which, you know, in that its own way. Like a saber toothed tiger, right? He gets so specialized. He thinks his power in that moment is focused all on the lightsaber. That's his weapon. He doesn't realize that the ether around them is your weapon as well. And so he can't do that because he doesn't, he's, he's trying to focus it into this. He's not being at one with the flowing force and using it, uh, to his advantage. He's trying to get it to do what he wants it to do in a focused point, like a laser yeah, versus yeah. A, a flood, you know? Yeah. Now, of course, uh, before, before all this, just to jump back, we do get the big fight where they do, they, they sort of, and it's, it's actually pretty neat what they do because they do, they do know that the that the stormtroopers are coming in, and what they do is they they do they do what you do, which is you make sure that they have a single entry point. You you pin them off so that they're coming in, and then you can control their flow. Now, granted, they're still going to overwhelm them, and they know this. They even make reference to this, like you know they've got they've got better weapons. There's more of them, you know. But we don't need to, and they really say we don't need to beat them. We just need to outlast them, um, you know, which is, of course, you know, a good strategy if you can work it out. You know, that's that's the thing. I mean, that is that is, you know, that is arguably where we always run into this problem when any kind of you're getting into this war is can you outlast them and how do you get to your your end game? Um, in this case, they lose a lot of people and it is a lot of people. Die, including you know uh, the young woman who was our rep, our our um, our uh, imperial double officer. agent, yeah, yeah, our imperial double agent. You know, I gotta say um, that moment where the robot uh, yes. gives his last breath, so to speak, uh, to 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 shield his friend, and he dies, and and the hurt in her eyes when he goes, you could tell how long. She has been yeah. able to rely on that robot and how many times he's probably yeah. saved her. And now even he couldn't do it. Like that moment was so heavy. It was more emotional and more interesting than anything up, up to that point in the season. And then they take it up a notch with her sacrificing herself. My God, she's an amazing, yeah. amazing actor. And that scene was so powerful. Oh, yeah. Like those two moments were the best uh, directed, best acted, best shot, best everything scenes in this entire series so far. You know, and you know what I really feel about that is I really feel that it's an aspect of that story that, you know, that Loto robot loved her. Yeah. You know, as much as a droid can love someone, and I'm not, I'm not trying to get into any kind of weird, right, you know, right. droid fetish thing or anything like that. I'm not trying to ship them. I'm trying to say that that droid, because they even, you could tell they had that relationship because even when, um, Leah says, what if you need to say something? Um, a couple uh, episodes ago, and, uh, the woman says, 
you would be, you know, your actions speak louder than your words, you know. And this is the whole point of this character. I mean, I'm, I'm sad that that great robot had to die, that great droid had to die. Um, but, you know, you really felt that that robot was going, if you're going down, boss, I'm going down with you. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it you was it was like a you know line. like some people have have dogs that are pets, and and they're good pets. But then some people you know you meet somebody that has like a dog that's their friend, right? They have like a yeah. a different, and that's what that robot was. That robot was. I mean, I guess robots have a different moral sense and a different set of places where their desires are aimed, right? They find purpose in different things. Um, and I think purpose is probably a very important thing to a sentient robot. And her and, and yeah, that yeah. robot, he found purpose in her. She gave him purpose, and he appreciated it. Um, and he was good at it. And they had a special yeah. thing. So, I mean, that was a really powerful moment. They, they delivered all of that in a couple of simple scenes with acting from a robot. And, and more so, I guess, how oh, yeah. it reflected off of her. But the two of them were, were really, really special. Yeah, well, you know, it's, and I've always said this, is that the art of silent acting Ooh. it is such an amazing skill. And it is something that I think too many people don't really respect, how you don't need a word to express an emotion. And, and that even, and, and again, like I say, that this, this robot, without even a squeak or a beep, you know, which is unique because most droids at least get some kind of noise they make even yeah. even a gonk droid does that you know the little hamster runners have a noise they make this one makes no noise whatsoever but somehow can emote somehow just the you know i don't i don't know how the cgi artists did it but honestly they deserve a race is what i'm going to tell you those cgi artists they deserve a race remarkable they, it's like a the subtlety of just like a head nod or a head shake or a shoulder shrug, there's so much that can be delivered in that. I know. And again, it shows that within the droid's mind, there is life and I, activity I love that. And, and reality. Yeah, it's, you know, well, that's, and that's the whole thing with Star Wars and their droids, you know, that they are really sentient beings, you know, and... Well, certainly there is this ownership concept to them. You see so many droids without restraining bolts, which is like they're just there because that's they exist and this is a job, you know? That's their purpose. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not even I, – I guess you, you can look at it as purpose, but you can also just look at it as – I guess it's the difference between purpose and function. Ooh. You know, it's like, you know, the, the, pit, the pit droids that, you know – um, oh. that we met in the Mandalorian. I mean, they, they're just, they're just, they 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 were built to fix things, so they fix things. But they have a whole life within that too. But yeah, and, they have they have a life that know, they go to after it. Well, exactly. You know, they they don't they don't only exist to do this. And I think that level of that 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 uh, sentience gives them something more. That makes them so much more alive. But at the same time, it's interesting because when you have an artificial life form like that, they can't really die either. You know, they can't, you know, I mean, you could destroy them, but their program can live on or you can fix them. And that's the thing. It's, and then you get into your whole ship of Theseus thing. You know, if we smash the droid, but put it back together, is it still the same droid? You know. Right. I mean, even if the data is stored in ones and zeros, right? I mean, that yeah. can be lost. Yeah. You can erase a hard drive or damage a hard drive. And then whatever stuff that wasn't copied to the cloud before it happened, you lose your save. We've all experienced it in video games, right? Um, your little yeah. brother pulls the wire out. You didn't get to a checkpoint. All that progress is gone forever. So, I mean, I there, there must be a certain measure of, of that, that once it's gone, it's gone. So in that way, they experience death, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, but I think that this is where, I think this is where I think the Star Wars is dealing with these, you know, AI, these, these droids. And I do think that they are more than just AI. Cause I kind of feel like there's something about the way droids are put together that goes beyond just programming. 
Yeah, I think so what we talked there- about last episode, I, I really like that theory. And I think I subscribed to that, that, you know, if you believe that human beings as, as our meat bodies are simply mm-hmm. antennae for something that exists somewhere uh, in, in a dimension that we can't perceive, but this is just our access point to that information and it reflects through this little uh, television set, so to speak. And, and if robots are sentient uh, as well, maybe there's another dimensional sort of thing that they're downloading and representing and expressing. Uh, and it could yeah. be a different kind of consciousness, but it might be just as elemental um, and, and, and um, um, what's the word I'm looking Intrinsic to the universe as, as our consciousnesses are. Yeah. And I can absolutely see that. It is it is interesting how it plays out because, you know, there's something about, like I said, there's something about the droids. And, and this one, and of course the Mandalorian with the, um, uh, uh, the, the assassin robot that was rebuilt and then yeah. found its own purpose, you know? And it's like, and it's, and it's interesting because it still has a purpose. It still has a programming. It still has a function. But it can override its own function. It can understand its own function, and it can it can move within it, it, it can it can it can move within the parameters set to to lie, if you will, to change what its programming is to say I can do this because I'm allowing myself to do this, and I can take this step beyond. Um, so it is really fascinating. I would love to see more droid centric stories. Hmm. You know, there is of course uh George Lucas's droids on Disney Plus. If you want to see what uh R2 D2 and uh C three PO got up to, I wanna say before they wound up on Tatooine. I think that's there's like a little I, and I'm not quite sure when it falls in the canon. I'm not even sure if it's canon anymore, but it was a Saturday morning cartoon with C-3PO and, and R2-D2 trying to get back to, not to Master Luke, but to, I think, uh, the guy who owned him before Luke, you know? Mm. Like, they got separated, and they go on all these adventures trying to get back to to uh, their boss. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like I said, I haven't seen it in years, and it, I don't know how canonical it is, but it is interesting how I would love the, to see like droid humor. What makes a droid laugh? You know, what makes a a, a droid feel? I wonder what like yeah. if droids had their own movies and their own sitcoms. What would that look like? You know. Well, you know, I think it's going to depend a lot on the droid. You know, I think that I think that a protocol droid approaches the world very differently mm. than an astromac, mm. and you know, or pitbot, or or you know, a little Lola companion. By the way, and I gotta say this: like one of the weirdest things about the Lola droid is just wondering, oh my gosh, was Lola on Alderaan when uh, it got blew- blown up? Like, why did she not take Lola with her on this diplomatic mission? Mm. <laughs> Obviously, you know, it just it, it makes you sad when you think about that. Like, what happened to Lola? Um, anyway, uh, yeah. we do get we do get in this um, Obi Wan speaking with Reva through the door. Sort of, um, you know, this is where she finds out what he's about. What he, what, and this is before they break in because this is where she goes in with the lightsaber and just honestly, you you, you immediately ask, what was the purpose of these doors? Yeah. Because, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. But once they do get themselves separated, um, he Obi-Wan decides he's going to give himself up. Um, he's going to go and, you know, and he basically goes to her and says, look, I know you want to kill Vader. If you bring him down here, you'll get your chance because he's not going to see you. He's just going to be focused on me. Now, I do want to say I kind of feel like he double crossed her in this because he got on that ship mm. and everything he said was true, but immediately it's like, you know, <clears throat> he, she's like, he's right in here. And then he's not restrained in any way and he just gets, gets to go. And it's like, you know, obviously Vader is, is mad about it. Um, although I, and I, I thought it was neat where they do the decoy ship first. Cause again, Vader's predictable. Yeah. They have the ship 
back to takeoff, and then you see him do the whole force thing. And he just pulls that it down so and he cool. rips the ship open. Oh yeah, so cool. <laughs> Yes, but what's neat about that is like you see that, but if you do look in the background, you do see that the other ship is there. Hmm. So you, it's, they, it's not like you, they were hiding the ship; it was it was always there. But um, you know, he just takes it, rips it apart, and then of course, while he's ripping it apart, and he sort of realizes, wait, where is everybody? The other ship just takes off and just shoots out into space, uh, which was cool. Hmm. And then, of course, Riva and uh, Darth Vader have their big showdown. Which and, I thought uh, I thought she would be smarter than that. Well, you know, I I agree. I think she. Well, you know, I think that like Vader, she's blinded by her own ambition. I could blinded see that. by what she wants. She wants to kill Vader. She wants to hurt Vader. Yeah, but they spent Vader the whole kills. entire series convincing her that that she's so clever and so smart. And yeah. so methodical that she's been for 20 years, or I don't know how old she is, but since she was, she's been holding it back, yeah. not letting it out to anybody. She's been playing the part. And all of a sudden, at the very end, she's just like, you know. Well, you know, like, I, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and again, it's because her rage got the better of her, just like it does for all dark side practitioners, you know? It yeah. gets the better of you. Because well, if you think about it, like, had she not come at him with a big swipe, had she just sort of just walked up behind him and then just a lightsaber? Yeah, so slow. Time. Just a, uh, <laughs> what for? I can't believe he got away, boss. You know? Yeah, that's oh, what you gosh. do. Yeah, it would have been smart. You know, so he must have used or, a Jedi mind trick on someone right. or something. Or, or it would have been know? cool <laughs> if if they showed her like being affected by Obi-Wan's betrayal. It's like, oh my god, he's not he's leaving. Oh my god, he go and then she goes into a fit of rage and goes, you know, that would have been cool. Like uh I wanted yeah. more from that moment. If you're gonna make it yeah. that simple, give me a little bit more of a reason to watch her get there and then I'd buy it. But it, I yeah. thought it was a little I mean you, well I guess you know what it came down to? And it's the old it's the old Thor thing. He wanted to make the speech. He wanted, and she wanted to like have him know what happened. Because uh -huh. if you think about it, she could have, as he's doing this, she could have come and taken out his knees. You know? Yeah, exactly. That, a whole host that, of things. Yeah, but she needed him to know what was happening. She needed him. She needed to feel that he understood the uh, the uh, the 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 the. She needed him to know that she was the one doing it and why. Yeah. And of course, that was her mistake because that's the thing. When you're, when you're trying to do, when you're trying to make a, when you start monologuing, when you get into your villain mode and you say, ha ha, you see, I was the one who you had to fear all along. And of course, it gets to that very end after Vader has just completely wiped the floor with her. And he says, you know, did you really think I didn't know? You know, it's like, of course I, you know, yes, I remember you. I remember killing all of your friends. <laughs> you know, when you showed up, I could, I sensed your age. I knew who you were, but I thought maybe, maybe we can work with this. You know, she's got a lot of anger. I got a lot of anger too, you know, and hey, I was, I was the chosen one. Maybe I can get to this young, make her understand why what we did was what we had to do. Do you think that was it, or did he keep her around for amusement? No, I think I don't think I don't think uh, Vader gets amused. I think oh. I think I think Vader kept her around because, well, Vader in general did not like the Inquisitors, as I understand it, like canonically, because it's like uh, you know it's the rule of two. There's only supposed to be a master and an apprentice. Um, but I think that with this. Uh, with this one specifically, but I think it, with them in general, I think he probably saw maybe a kindred spirit, you know, someone that was filled with anger and rage. Because, hmm. you know, as she said, and she's right about the Jedi, you know, she's right. Where were the Jedi? They, they were supposed to protect us, and they did not. They did nothing. And that is the truth, you know. Um, there was lots of ways they could have 
dealt with the Anakin problem. There's lots of ways they could have dealt with the Palpatine problem. They chose not to. Yeah, that and and to uh, maybe she has a point that that they did not know how to properly raise that child to educate that child. Yeah. I mean, like, consider him like a special needs kid, right? Um, you need someone who understands how to deal with a special needs kid. And they just, you know, let a, a decent teacher who's a good teacher for all the other kids. And they're like, hey, maybe you can do And he was not prepared. And yeah. that was their failing. Well, and I think that basically the entire premise of the Jedi with their taking these children at such a young age is such a flawed idea. Hmm. And, the, you know, even when we have... Obi-Wan talking about it, like, you know, I think I had a brother, or I, I think there was mm-hmm. another child, you know? It's like, he doesn't even know who his family was. And you think about these kids just taken from their families at uh, as children, and then, you know, raised in this cult to be Jedi warriors, you know? Uh, it, it, it does, it, it could sound unseemly when you think about it. And I think that the more you you know, especially when you suffer that defeat and you realize, man, I did not have to be there. I could have been home with whatever my family was, you know, and they, they took me there. Um, we get the, uh, we get the return of the Grand Inquisitor. Hmm. So, you know, reports of his death were greatly exaggerated. As I think I had made a point, it's like the guy's already got robot parts. It's like, you know, like getting stabbed in the stomach, that's like the least fatal way to die. Yeah, and, I, and I'm disappointed in Reva that she didn't cut his head off. That's again, it, it flies in the face of what that character, I think, would have done. Yeah, well, because I think she, I think on some level she felt it was enough, you know, and she didn't want to overdo it because she wanted to blame Kenobi for it, you know. Sure, yeah, I can, yeah. You know, yeah. and if and if everyone tells her he's dead, then it worked. You know, if she thinks he's dead, and everyone tells oh. her she's dead, yeah, you make sure. Which actually suggests, you don't think. You make sure. <clears throat> I mean, I agree, but then, but then the story doesn't happen. You know, I guess. You know, it's like, eh. but you. Ugh. Sorry, along those same lines, along those same lines, they leave Riva alive too. Again. It, it it must be for a reason. Well, I he think the, yeah, I think the reason is is what they said was that you you know you're not worth killing. That you know the only thing that you were you know you're never gonna and honestly, I mean it's, it's kind of foolish because they clearly have killed younglings. Mm. We saw they had that little youngling in the in the tomb. So I, I guess maybe this was sort of their. Um, you know, you but you you killed a lot of Jedi for us, and you know what? We do respect what you did. Consider this your golden parachute. We're going to stab you a little and leave you in the dust. Yeah, the only thing that makes what? sense to me is like, oh, she's going to be useful down the road. Yeah, you know? and probably because obviously she could be, you know. Yeah. And, and that's the thing because she because here's the thing: no matter what she chooses to do next. It's not like she can join the rebellion. She just killed a bunch of people in the rebellion. Nobody is going to welcome her in. And she's out of, out, out, on the outs with the Empire, so she's nothing she can do with them. You know, I mean, really, what could she possibly do? Be about because no matter where she goes for the rest of her life, she's branded. Right. Have you ever, ever saw that old cowboy show? Branded. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. But yeah, but it's yeah just, she's gonna she she she'd make a great bounty hunter, a gun for hire, an assassin. You know, she could do that. You know, uh, there there are places in the outer rims where she could ply her trade. You know, but you know, it's also just the idea that that sort of that's your, that's your, her only option. Her option is not to be any person that gets to have a life. It's just you're right. going to be you're going to be hated no matter where you go. And let's face it. Even the bounty hunters, most of them have have limits, you know. Because mm-hmm. let's fa- you know, because when you get down to it, any e- even the people that were former former imperials, they're gonna look at her and say, "Oh yeah, you betrayed the empire, you know. You killed you you, you led your people to slaughter for no good reason." 
Maybe you wanted them dead. Maybe you wanted those those uh, stormtroopers dead. And, yeah, I mean, I don't you know. know. If I if I need somebody gotten, if I need somebody gone, it seems like a pretty effective person to carry that out. Could be. And now, now of course, and and of course, to help the story happen, she finds the little communicator from uh, mm. Senator Organa, where she hears the child on Tatooine and Owen, and so now she knows what she has to do. So we have to see what she does with all of that. Next and episode. the uh, the episode um, ends with a nice little shot of a sleeping young man, a child. Oh, who was, rather. oh the child. Oh, a child sleeping. Yeah. Well, you know, because that's the hope. That's the <laughs> hope is that they're going to get away. They're going to su- survive, and the little child gets to sleep. Yeah. All well, right. I mean, Marzi. that's that's Luke, right? At the end there. Oh, Luke. Oh, right. no, okay. I didn't. I you know I forgot. I forgot exactly how it ended. Yeah. So yeah. yes. <laughs> Sorry, Maz, I didn't know. No, no. Yes. Yeah, little Luke. He's so sleeping. hopefully uh, uh, you get your wish fulfilled at the uh, the very last episode. Although, that's the last episode, today's episode, right? Uh, today's episode, yeah. Episode 6 is the last one. We'll talk about it next week. Mm. Um, you get to find out how how uh, Obi-Wan gets out, of, gets out of this wacky mess. Mm. Um uh yeah and you know uh hopefully people have watched this and enjoyed this and if you've already watched the uh final episode and would like to give us your thoughts on that you can always write to us at capes and lunatics at gmail.com that's capes and lunatics all spelled out all one word at gmail.com you know also call us leave us a voicemail where you can give us your thoughts and we can play them on the air uh, at 614 382 2737. That's 614 38 Capes. And of course, go down to our show notes, uh, click on linktree, L A N K T R dot E E slash Capes and Lunatics. And there you're going to see all of our merch, our aluminium mugs, wonderful t shirts, phone cases, <clears throat> and the ability to give us money in the Patreon, which will get you exclusive content. Uh, including uh, video um, and uh, voting on the worst superhero movie of all time this week, Superman versus Superman three versus Superman four, which really was the best Superman of all time, and which was the worst. All right, uh, Maz, if people have any thoughts on that and they'd like to share them with you, how can they find you? Uh, if anybody wants to write to me and tell me that Superman 3 is the best Superman movie of all time, they can reach me at mozmanzor at gmail.com uh, or find me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And, of course, you can always write to me in that same old-fashioned email way that we are mothers and fathers once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet things when I feel like it, at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. <laughs> All right, you filthy landlubbers. You come to the end of another raucous night tossed in tempest tossed uh, television as we once again sail full stream ahead. Yeah.